Um, our chief curator, Elizabeth Farish, uh, asked me to do some work on the objects that were gonna be in the Wendell exhibit. Um, I guess it was two years ago now. Um, so I just wanted to show you a couple of those. These are, um, these are two um, side chairs uh, from a much larger group that are in the Stephen Chase house. Um, you can see uh, on the right, uh, these chairs had suffered from years of exposure to um, basically dirt um, and humidity. Uh, and over time, those combine to uh, form a, a, a dirty film on the furniture, uh, much like your car over time. So um, basically what I do is I very carefully remove that layer of grime to try to get back to the original finish. Um, you may never actually get to the original finish, but you can see there's quite a difference. Um, and what I really loved in being able to do these objects is that these, these gold painted items were to try to enhance the limited light that would have been available in the Chase Parlor, for example. Um, you know, before there was electric light, they had candlelight. And so these things would really pop um, as opposed to something that was dark painted uh, or something that was really dirty, like on the right here. So. Uh, this is a little jewelry box that was also part of that uh, that same exhibit. Um, I sort of took it when I was halfway through. Again, you can see how you can really bring things back just by simply cleaning them. And then finally, um, the Wendell fire buckets, which are uh, pretty infamous. Um, they're owned by uh, Ron Bourgeau, who owns the Wendell House, and they hang there to this day. They've hung in the Wendell House their entire life, and you can see they're dated 1815. And all those years, uh, you know, over 100 years, almost 200, over 200 years hanging in this one spot, um, they had collected a lot of dirt. Uh, and so trying to bring them back, and these are leather, it's really, really difficult to get all the dirt. You can see almost uh, how they've uh, crackled over time. The dirt gets into those cracks and it's just, you know, it's not something at least I can do. I'm sure a professional conservator perhaps could have done a, an even more complete job, but you can see the ones on the left uh, that I had worked on certainly look better than the ones on the right. And you can start to distinguish the, the markings, which was really nice for the exhibit, so. Um, two golden rules, if you take away nothing else from today, go slow, go slow, go slow. <laughs> this is not a fast process. If you do things quickly, you can really damage what you're working on. So you have to go slow and try to do things that are reversible. Um, duct tape is not reversible. So uh, we wanna try to use things that if for some reason we find out later on that it was a mistake, we can take it off. Uh, a great example you might be familiar with is a lot of people use scotch tape to uh, pay, uh, repair a tear in a piece of paper. And if you go and look at that scotch tape in even five years these days, you'll see that it has yellowed and really uh, detracts from the, um, the, the item that it's supposed to be repairing. Um, I'll be showing you today some other uh, ways you can do that, but um, scotch tape is not reversible. If you were to try to pull that off, you could really do more damage to the item. So try to do things that are reversible or undoable. So that's it for my slides. So I'm gonna go back to the Zoom here. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see me. I'm gonna put this down here. There we go. So hello everyone. <laughs> um, so I wanted to take you a few a few things, um, just just things that you you know could do at home. Um, uh, I'm going to start with something made of wood. So here is a um, a tankard. It's a, typically called a peg tankard. Uh, from York, Maine. Uh, I'll do a close-up view. You can see there's two windows there now. Um, this is made of walnut uh, and it dates from um, the 1700s. And you can see on the top, especially how there's quite a bit of dark coloration. Uh, and especially when you compare it to the side, um, that really should be a brighter color. So we're gonna work on that a little bit. Um, and to do that, um, and I'm using Carter Center because they've got all the tools here that I don't have. But so um, just a couple of things that I use. Um, these are called Webrill pads. I think you can see those. Webrill pads. Um, they're a, a cotton pad. Uh, you buy them in these big sleeves. Low lint, soft, absorbent, non-scratch. Uh, all good things for cleaning objects. Um, so we have some of those. And then um, my preferred cleaner, um, though it's harder to find these days, is Soilax. Um, and um, it's just a really, uh, it's a very, very strong cleaner actually. So the mixing is really crucial. So what we do here is um, 
we set it up in these small uh, decanting bottles and uh, actually write on the bottles the strength and I measure it in teaspoons. So um, this particular one is um, one, point, uh, one teaspoon of Soilax to, this is eight ounces of water. Um, and I would never go above four teaspoons um, to eight ounces of water, for example. Um, and you always want to start with a lower, you know, you're, you're really wanting, again, we're going slow, we're going slow. There's no instant gratification through this process. You gotta, <laughs> so you take a wee brill pad and uh, I don't know if I can do, hopefully you can see this, but so all I'm, I mean, you know, it's, it's simply just rubbing it. Uh, I tend to like to go in one direction and you want to frequently check the uh, pad to see if the color you're getting out is dirt or it might be some, you know, if it's paint or for example, I don't know if I can, so you can see, um, you know, that's just yuck. Um, so we can keep doing that and, and keep checking the pad. So I'm gonna actually um, switch to the other side of the pad, which is clean, um, but there's some of the soil ax, you know, leaked or absorbed through it. And you keep doing that and, you know, you can see that gets dirty. So you throw that away and you get a new one. Um, I can tell you and <laughs> when I was doing this for Strawberry Bank on a regular basis, we went through thousands of, soil, of these weevil pads, thousands and thousands. And that's just kind of what you have to do. Um, you know, you don't want to redeposit the, the surface dirt. Um, so you need to just make some swipes and you could see it, it actually begins to pick up speed as you've added more soil ax to it. So I'm actually cutting through um, the yuck even faster. Um, and so you actually, you know, you want to check more frequently as that occurs um, and you want to uh, just keep going slow. Uh, you can see it just still comes off. And then um, I think you can see, start to see a difference between um, the way it was and, and how it's looking. I don't have enough time to finish it, but I will keep doing that until um, I either start to see a brownish tinge that may be finish um, but I'm not getting that black um, anymore. Um, and so after that, I reach a point where I feel pretty good and it's certainly, you know, looking better than it was. I'm just going to stop. Uh, and then um, I'm just going to take a Webril pad uh, with, with plain water. And I'm just going to swipe that a couple of times to get any detergents off of it. Um, and then um, what you can do with wooden objects is you can seal them. So this is a piece from my collection and it sits on a shelf in my living room every day, 365 days a year. Um, the light levels are good, it's on a shelf, so it's not sitting in the direct sun, that's important. Um, the humidity in my house, I'm sure much like your own, is all over the place. Uh, and of course, you know, there is dust in the house. And since I do most of the dusting, there's a lot of dust in the house. Um, and so the problem with the humidity and the dust is that you'll get some dust on it and then it will get moistened by that humidity uh, and it, it almost becomes a surface and it will happen again and again and again. And that's what causes this sort of blackness over you know, decades of, of time. Um, so what makes it easier so I don't have to do this again is if I put a protective uh, coating on it <clears throat> using something called microcrystalline wax. Uh, and it is just that, it's a pure, pure, pure wax. Um, it will make this object really, really pop. I'll do it uh, just a little teeny bit here because I haven't finished cleaning. So another great friend of the conservator is the Q-tip. We buy it, you know, <laughs> by the hundreds. So you put a little wax on there um, and then you just simply um, apply that into an area, rub it in. And you'll let that dry for a while and then you'll buff it with another Weebl pad. And that's now the top surface of this object. And so down the road, if I need to clean it, it's gonna be much, much easier because it's not the wood that I'm cleaning, it's the wax. Um, and so that's just, it's kind of a protective barrier. And there's other examples that I'll show in a second of why that's a really helpful, um, helpful thing. So, by the way, the Q-tip, you might find this gross, but the Q-tip, it's also helpful because as my former boss here at Strawberry Bank once said, um, his name is John Mayer, he said, never belittle the power of spittle. This is a very good cleaner. 
Spit is actually a great cleaner. It's not great if you just had a big curry dinner, for example, but if, you're, if your spit's pretty clear, it, it actually, you know, it's got enzymes in it. And so you can use that on an object uh, and then it will do a super job of, uh, of cleaning the surface as well. Um, I, you know, prefer the spick and span because after a while your tongue, you know, anyway. Um, but you can do that, especially in really hard to reach places. Uh, you know, there might be a, a crevice um, you'll see on the handle here. See that little um, etched line, how black that is. And that's gonna be really hard to get with a weevil pad. So Q-tip with a little spittle might help um, a lot in that particular case. So. so that's a wooden object. You can do that with any furniture that you have or any wooden object you have, like the gold chairs, that's how I did those. Um, that jewelry box I showed you, that's how I did those. Um, and you know, you, you'll look at objects and you'll see it's just not as bright as it used to be. Um, or you'll see a, a piece of mahogany, you know what a nice finished piece of mahogany looks like. For some reason it looks dull and grimy. And so you can take that approach and it will really help it. <clears throat> so there's wood. So another one is, is metals. This is a, um, a uh, Boston made, um, what, what's called a can. Some people call it a tankard, but it's a can because it doesn't have a lid. Um, this was made by Benjamin Burt, a Boston silversmith. Uh, in the late 1700s. And I'm sure you all recognize tarnish when you see it. That's what this is. It's hor horribly tarnished. Um, now, tarnish is a direct result of air and humidity exposure. That's what causes tarnish. And it's affecting the, um, and it, also your fingerprints too. Uh, greasy fingerprints will also cause tarnish. You can actually see fingerprints in a piece because they'll tarnish faster because of the acids in, in, the, um, in the fingerprints. Um, so when you go to polish silver, what you are actually doing is removing some of the silver uh, to get rid of the tarnish. Um, not such a big deal, except if you have to polish it all the time. And especially if you have um, important or um, nice decoration like this one does right here, that's very, you know, that's only the top surface of silver. If I'm rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it, rubbing it over time, I'm gonna lose that detail. Um, so, you know, it's best, to either not polish it because it's not a big deal, um, you know, which is what I tend to do because I don't have a lot of time. Um, but if you do want to polish it, it's okay. But then again, you maybe want to seal it to slow down the tarnishing process. So I can just show you that. Um, so at Strawberry Bank uh, for years and years, we've used what's called Never Dull. Um, it's my preferred polish. The reason that is this is a, a chemically treated uh, wadding um, I'll show you, it's, it's almost like a Webril pad. Um, the can has this wadding material in it, which is impregnated with the, the you know, the tarnish remover. Um, and the advantage of this over a paste, for example, is the paste, which you may have seen this, it gets into the crevices and it, it, over time it will turn a white chalky powder. Uh, it's really tough to get that paste out of all the tiny nooks and crannies. This won't do that. Um, and the other thing you never want to use is, is what they call dip. Um, I'm sure you've seen where you can dip the silver right into this chemical and it instantly comes out beautiful. Well, the reason is, is because it's taken off a lot of silver. It eats through the silver really, really fast. So that's not great either. Um, so we, we like this, this material here. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you've polished silver before. So, um, you know, if I rub this enough, You know, it starts to look pretty good. You can see the wadding turns the color of the tarnish. Um, so you got to keep moving it around because you don't want to deposit that back on the surface. So I'm just going to do one tiny area here so you get the idea. So there it is again. It's, you know, it gets pretty gross. Um, <clears throat> so there's the part we just did. We polish it up with a clean cloth of some sort. So you can see it's, you know, looks pretty good at this point. That's the right spot. You can see that, that particularly good clean area. And then same thing again with a microclistern wax. Great stuff. It's just a, a wax that's going to seal the silver surface from the oxygen. You know, you're basically um, not allowing the humidity and the oxygen to get to the silver. So you apply it just like you would wax car. 
Just put it on, let it dry for about a minute. You'll notice that it also acts as an anti-tarnishing. Um, it's also gonna take off some, some silver, if you will. Um, so you let that just sit and sort of dry for maybe a minute, a minute or two at the most. And then you'll take a clean pad and you'll buff it. Um, and that's, you've got a nice clean and somewhat sealed surface. It's gonna tarnish again. Um, the only way to, to never prevent that is um, to lacquer it, uh, which is some professional conservators can do. Uh, they put a permanent sealant on it. Um, I don't do that because I don't know how, plus uh, it's very difficult to reverse, which is why conservators can do it. They can make sure that the piece is you know, correctly cleaned and then put this really permanent surface on it, lacquer surface on it that um, will keep the oxygen from tarnishing the surface. So, but for you at home, you know, it's really easy to polish silver and that wax will really help um, keep it, prevent it from, um, from tarnishing over time. So uh, other things, here's a um, 1800s or so uh, flip glass. Um, uh, it's just glass. Uh, the really scary thing about glass is that it is very susceptible to um, changes in temperature. Um, so when you clean it, you don't want to use very hot water, for example. Um, you don't want it, to, if this was stored in a very cold place, in an unheated place, and it was very, very, very cold, you want to let it bring it up to room temperature um, so that the, there's not a huge difference between the temperature of what you're using to clean it, the water, uh, and the object itself because um, it will shatter, it will break. Uh, thermal shock, it's called. So I like to use um, in, um, for the museum's objects, I used to, I like to use like a denatured alcohol. Uh, cleans things really, really well. Obviously glass is not a porous surface, so you can use whatever you want. But um, the, the advantage is if I use water, it's got to dry. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. You know, it, it's just, it, there's less control. If I use alcohol, it, it evaporates very, very quickly and it will clean the surface really, really quick. So weeble pad, a little alcohol, rub, 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 and you're pretty much done. You can wax this if you want to, but there isn't a great benefit to it. Um, glass is just kind of what it is and it's pretty easy to clean. So not a lot to that. <clears throat> uh, what else? So the other thing I brought in, So I don't know if any of you have old books, leather, um, beautiful, beautiful old leather books. Um, the museum has lots and lots of them. Um, this one's, um, this particular one is mine. It dates from about 1570, I think. Um, and what happens with leather uh, obviously is, is an animal product. Um, and uh, like all things that are organic, um, they die over time. Uh, they just wear out. Leather is no exception to that. It, you know, it just isn't, it wasn't made to be around forever. Um, and it gets what's called red rot, where it actually delaminates and decays. So we can try to keep this book for as long as we possibly can, um, but it's going to fight that process the whole way. So um, this is an object I actually used with the kids when I do uh, young curators, but there's um, a couple of different materials. Um, so we use, um, uh, what do we use? We use Gaylord as a source for um, uh, sort of archival materials uh, that we use here at the museum. Um, they're readily available to the public as well. Um, we also use uh, University Products is another company that sells archival materials and conservation materials. So this is called Cellugel. Let's see if I can get that um, in there. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, it's a cellulose material. Uh, and it helps to uh, reconstitute the leather. Again, slow down that decaying process. Uh, it says it's a safe penetrating consolidant for leather book covers affected by red rot. So uh, that works really well. And uh, there's also another one here, which is a leather uh, cleaner. Is that the, oops, I think I lost. I think my phone froze. I'll do it this way. <laughs> so there's another uh, leather preservator. It's uh, called uh, Leather Cleaner Restore Preservative Accessible Preservatives. Um, this is a little bit more of a wax um, as opposed to the other ones, the cellulose. Both perfectly viable. You could actually use them interchangeably. Um, and the process is the same. Um, this book was done fairly recently. Does this come back by any chance? So um, you can see the surface, like you see this spot. Uh, 
right here uh, where the sort of the, the uh, layer of the leather is worn out. That's really susceptible to red rot. Uh, and you can see other wear areas that are like that. So uh, you can take a Q-tip, you can use either of these materials uh, and you can just generously apply it to the, um, to the entire cover for that matter. But you'll see uh, it absorbs it like a sponge uh, and it makes it happy again, basically. <laughs> So I don't know if you can see that difference, but it takes on a little sheen, um, consolidates the leather materials, the layers of the leather, leather um, and um, just protects it as well. So same thing, you just kind of let it dry for a little while, um, and then you take a, a cotton pad and you gently buff it, wipe it. And you'll see it will still save that shine a little bit and just doesn't look as dry as it did before. Um, so that, that's, you could do this to the entire cover. Um, the other areas, the issues this had, um, the cover detached over time. It's very typical, you know, the opening, closing, opening, closing, it just snaps the leather. It's, um, and so in this particular case uh, with the kids, I put on some uh, Japanese tissue hinges to reattach these. They're not pretty. Um, it's, you know, there, there are conservators who can do it, uh, so you probably even never know it was a detached, but basically you're using a material called Japanese tissue, uh, and you can see that there. It's a um, pH neutral uh, woven paper, very, very strong given how thin it is. Uh, it doesn't yellow over time. It doesn't degrade over time. You can uh, color it. Uh, to, so in this case, you know, I might use a brown acrylic paint to match the binding. Um, and you can make this in any size you want. Um, so I could do the entire binding um, on the book with one long strip and reattach it that way. Uh, you'd still notice it, but it would keep it together. It would make it usable. Uh, and because we use uh, an adhesive here uh, called PVA or polyvinyl acetate, um, this is a water soluble glue. So I can put this on the book um, and anytime in, down the road for whatever reason it, we want it to come off, you would simply brush it with a paintbrush with water on it and that adhesive would immediately let go and we could take the hinge off. So very simple repair, uh, very reversible, no harm done. Um, you know, it, it, if you took it to a professional conservator, they'd find a way to more permanently attach it. but. Um, you know, this is just something you could do at home with these materials you can buy online. So, so we did that um, to this book. Both covers were off. Uh, I think you can see the hinge there and there. Um, this one actually, I just broke it. <laughs> and then on the other side, we did four. And you can see we tinted these a little bit um, just to try to blend them into the um, into the binding. So, so that's sort of how you reattach the uh, the big leather book. Um, inside uh, is a little more difficult. You know, there's, there's pages that have come out as well. You can, what's called tipping those in where you, uh, so you can see these, this is completely dis detached. I could make those same hinges and just re-tip this in. Um, it wouldn't look beautiful, but again, it's completely reversible. So no harm done. Um, and you just wanna just, just really be really careful. Um, I think there's some actually color pages in this book somewhere. Um, those inks will run really, really fast if they get wet. So try to avoid color images. Try to av even avoid the um, the ink, the black letters, um, and and do the hinging in an area where um, there's no no letters at all. Um, and you can see that's easy to do in this particular case because um, there's this big um, sort of margin that that you could use safely to reattach those pages. So. So I need to reattach this, but that's fine. It gives me something to do with the kids down the road. So, um, so the only other item I was gonna talk to you about, and I think I've got enough time to do it, is um, iron or uh, other forms of metal other than silver. So here's a horseshoe, you know, iron, it rusts. That's just what happens. Um, the easy thing about this is that um, you can't really hurt it. <laughs> it's pretty indestructible. Um, but the rust over time will actually make this item disappear. I mean, it just, you could crumble in your hand if you don't try 
to stop the rusting process. Um, there was a woman who contacted me a while back. Um, she's got a family trunk. Um, it has some, um, I'm guessing, iron um, corners, you know, that would protect the trunk when it was being used for a, as a piece of luggage. Uh, and they had been rusted. So this is kind of how you would treat that item. Um, there is, believe it or not, uh, different grades of steel wool. Uh, so steel wool, you, I'm sure you all know what it is, but this particular one is quadruple zero steel wool, which is the finest on the market. Uh, it's, it, so there's coarse, uh, in fact, yeah, on the back you can see it will say uh, quadruple zero uh, for buffing and cleaning all the way down to a single zero, which is medium fine for cleaning and removing down to uh, number four, which is extra coarse. If you're really trying to rip something apart to get whatever. So we always use the finest. If you were sanding, you do the finest with steel. Will you use the finest again, because we're gonna go real slow and we don't want it to take off huge amounts. Um, so with um, iron like this, uh, obviously water and iron don't mix well. That's what caused the rust in the first place. So we want to use uh, a medium that will evaporate very quickly. Um, you can use um, the alcohol that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that obviously evaporates very quickly. Um, there's also um, thymol, which is a pretty heavy duty material. You want to use it outside, but it's what you find in um, that, that strong odor in nail polish uh, is thymol. It evaporates incredibly quickly and it's very, very strong. So, um, you know, kind of scary stuff, but if you did it outside, same thing, you would apply it to the steel wool and just keep rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and rubbing um, to try to remove the loose rust. Um, you're never going to get this back to some shiny thing because it never was. It was never a, a puffed, you know, sort of finish. If you're trying to get some of that loose rust off, some of the worst decay that's on the surface. And then again, you want to seal it. So you want to use the crystalline wax um, to seal that, to keep the oxidation happening, just to prevent the rust, to slow it down. Uh, again, if I was a conservator, I would probably use something more permanent and heavy duty uh, that, but if I was a conservator, I could then undo it if I needed to. I, I don't know how to do that. So I use a crystalline wax. Um, it just doesn't have the lasting power as um, some other materials, but it works great. It's very inexpensive, easy to get. Um, so you would do that. You would just keep a, a running it. Now, the trunk that I mentioned, I believe those metal pieces were once painted black. Um, so you're going to have to go slow and sort of balance trying to treat the rusted areas uh, with the painted areas. And then there's nothing wrong with putting a black paint back on a surface that was painted. Um, that was the original intent uh, and that will protect it wonderfully. Um, so I wouldn't do it to the horseshoe because there's no evidence it was ever painted. But with that trunk, it was clearly painted. Um, it was probably ornate at some point. So you could get uh, a nice black, shiny black paint and reapply that after you've removed some of the corrosion. That would be a good thing to do. Uh, and it would protect that metal going forward for pretty much ever. So, so I think with that, um, I don't know if there's questions, Bethany, or if people have objects that they wanted to ask me about, but I'm happy to. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. And Rodney, can we start with photographs? Can you talk a little bit about how to protect and preserve photographs, um, particularly yeah. uh, an interest in tin types? Yes, um, photographs are, um, are pretty scary because the, the, depending on the type of photograph, um, is dependent on, on what they were made of. So if we talk about photographs that we all know from, you know, sort of Polaroids to, um, to film, uh, you know, uh, 35 millimeter film, um, those are all chemical reactions. They um, react differently to the environment. Um, so in general, those types of images want to be in the dark and they want to be in a, um, uh, a dry place and a cool place. So if you have your photo albums, for example, in your attic and it's 180 degrees up there on a summer day, very bad, very, 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 very bad. Uh, if you have your photographs uh, in the sun for whatever reason, you know, hanging on a wall um, that sees the sun, very, 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 very bad. Um, it's, you're better to take a, a copy of that photograph and put that in the frame and put the original in a drawer uh, in an album uh, that's closed so the light can't get to it. And then someplace in the main body of your house 
The basement would be okay if it's a dry basement. If it's not crazy humid down there, that would be okay too, but never the attic. Never, never, never. never. Um, so um, photo albums, uh, just a worry about those. You get all sorts of quality on photo albums. Uh, you know, typically they have adhesive that holds the photo in place. Um, some of those adhesives actually um, will brown the photograph over time and they're hard to get the photograph out. And so you'll actually tear it trying to take it out. So I like the static cling ones um, that just hold the photo in place using a, a plastic film. Um, try to get arch archival photo albums that are used with acid-free materials and they'll be readily marked that way. A little bit more expensive, but a very safe way to keep your photos. Album, or photos. As we go uh, farther back in time and we get to tin types and uh, other types of um, like gel uh, photographs, um, those are even more reactive uh, in general. Keep them in boxes in the dark, um, low humidity. Uh, tin types are very um, susceptible to humidity and temperature. So trying to find that sort of place in your house that doesn't change very much. If you have central air conditioning, that tends to be easier. If you don't, um, then one of the things that we do in the museum world is we encapsulate something. So if your house changes environments, you know, temperatures and humidities and light levels all the time, and there's really nothing you can do, how can you encapsulate the item to protect it from those elements? Um, and it can be something as putting a photograph in a drawer. Now you have created a micro environment, a, a, a more uh, controllable environment inside that drawer. Uh, we have items uh, that are framed in the museum's collection where the piece of artwork is actually sealed inside uh, plastic. It's in its own bubble, if you will. Um, and so the temperature and the humidity and the pollutants in the house never, ever touch the artwork because they're completely encapsulated. So you could do that. So if you had a photograph, you had a tin type, you had any type of photograph, if you put it um, in some sort of archival bag, if you put it inside a photo album, if you put the photo album inside a shelf or inside a drawer, now you have totally sort of insulated it from the environment that might otherwise exist in your house. Um, so that's a really good way to protect those things. Um, there are some early uh, glass plate negatives. Um, I can't quite think of the term. They are very dangerous because they can combust. Uh, and I don't even tell you, um, to be honest with you, um, the museum, uh, sent those to a conservator in Andover, Massachusetts. We had negatives made, we had prints made, and then we safely disposed of those um, negatives because they're so dangerous. Um, there's just no way to store them with other things safe. So um, if you have some of those really, really, really early uh, negatives, um, you might want to send me an email. We'll talk about it more. So <clears throat> other questions? When you're working with an object that's made out of wood that has not been treated in any way, hasn't been um, painted or um, lacquered, um, are there any special considerations when you're trying to clean or restore it? Yeah, they are. I'm glad you asked. That's a totally different um, animal in a way because you know wood is uh, hydroscopic. It's gonna wanna absorb whatever you treat it with. Um, so the best way to actually is not to use a, a liquid. So um, there's a couple of options. Uh, if it's got that sort of dirt appearance that I showed you, um, I'll just pull this out again, but let's say this was an untreated piece of oak. Um, you can use what's called a Mars Statler eraser. Let's see if I can get that. You'll find these at, you know, like staples. Um, they're, they literally are just an eraser. Um, the advantage they have, though, is they don't deposit material onto the surface. They simply pull the dirt away. So a Mars Statler eraser is one. Or if you want to get a little fancier, uh, you have these big pads called soot remover. They're a waterless sponge, essentially. Same idea. They use the, the material that it's made out of to pull the dirt off the surface. Um, and so on a wooden surface, you would simply rub um, you know, you just rub that material and you'll see the dirt pull up. Um, you can actually see if I do that long enough, you'll see the, um, the eraser will start to turn black and it's pulling the dirt up. It's a long process, but, um, that, that will work well. This, you take a small piece of, um, you know, cut off with a pair of scissors 
and then you rub in one area. And when that turns black, you know, to another area and you just keep doing that until the whole thing is black. Then you throw it away and you get a new piece. Um, you can't reuse these. With the Mars Tatler eraser, you can see how this has been chiseled away because what we'll take is a knife and we'll cut off the black part to get to a new piece and then just keep going. Um, so you just eventually you use it up. Um, but that's how you do it on untreated wood because you don't want to introduce water that will be sucked down into the surface. Um, all you can do is try to pull those dirts away. Um, and you don't want to wax those either for the same thing. It's going to soak in and it wouldn't be reversible because it's caused more harm than good. Um, so you just want to try to remove some of those dirts and leave it alone. <clears throat> There's another one actually too. This is more for um, paper things, um, but it's it's basically a, um, a large pad of eraser material and you can make small circles on a, on a piece of paper to um, remove dirt and contaminants. They work really well on, um, on paper objects. Uh, on leather too would be fine. Um, probably could use it on wood too if you wanted to. And this is another uh, sort of university of products uh, or Gaylord product. Um, and is there anything uh, particularly, um, uh, something different you should do to preserve newsprint um, compared to the other paper products we talked about today? No, um, newsprint obviously is um, very sensitive to um, liquids of any kind. Um, if you've ever gotten your morning newspaper wet, you know it doesn't do well. So it's strictly dry cleaning. Those things I just showed you, the Maristatler eraser, um, the soot remover, um, you will, uh, if you're cleaning an area that's got print on it, you will pick up some of that color. So you want to go very lightly, you know, touch very lightly, uh, try and remove some of the dirt around the ink. Um, uh, and, you know, you don't want to do it very often. So, you know, you give something that, that's very important to you, a newspaper article very important to you, you give it a general cleaning, and then you put that into an archival sleeve to keep the dirt off it going forward. Um, I'm sure you've seen those uh, sort of clear plastic sleeves. Um, they actually make bags, archival bags. You could use one of those too. But it's the kind of thing newspapers are very sensitive. So you want to clean them once and then keep them protected from the environment uh, going forward. And Rodney, you mentioned those flammable prints earlier. Um, were you referring to nitrate-based films? I was, thank you, whoever sent that in. That's exactly what I was referring to. Very, very dangerous. <laughs> And the museum had a bunch of them stored in our vault. Um, and so we, we got a grant to send them all down to the Northeast Document Conservation Center in North Andover, Massachusetts, uh, where they uh, made color or made proper negatives of them and prints from those negatives. And then the nitrate were, um, were destroyed. I mean, it just, there's no safe way to keep them uh, and they're very, very dangerous. So. All right, and I think that's all we have for today. Um, Rodney, thank right. you so much, and thank you all for coming. Um, I do want to just remind everybody that we do have an in-person event coming up at Strawberry Bank. Uh, we have uh, guided tours Memorial Day weekend, and you can purchase tickets online at strawberrybank.org. Um, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks all. Bye-bye.